Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Introduction to Image Processing for High Content Screening. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mark Bray. Dr. Bray is a data scientist, Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them at the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following at the end of the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Bray. I will now turn the presentation over to him. So welcome everyone to this educational program from SBI2. So I will be walking you through as um, an intro to high content screening, high content analysis, image and data analysis. Um, my name is Mark Bray. I'm a, a um, data scientist from uh, NIBR, the Navarre's Institutes of Biomedical Research. And it's my pleasure to be presenting in front of you today. So just as a broad overview, what I'll be presenting is actually part of a kind of a larger toolkit. To build up any sort of high content screening lab, you need a, a whole host of basic uh, skills, including biology, fluorescence microscopy, instrumentation, informatics, and data analysis. So everything I'm going to be presenting um, to you is much is part of a much larger set um, of other skills as well. And in particular, um, I'll divide this into three buckets. There's the um, assay development part, which of course is the mo one of the most important parts of any HCS um, lab. And then there's the hardware and image acquisition. And assuming that you have both of those things in place, um, then the image and data analysis comes later. But the success of any sort of image and data um, analysis campaign hinges on having the first two pieces um, put together in a, in a fairly tight way. So as far as an outline goes, I'll be um, walking you through these following um, subcategories. Uh, the image is quantitative data. Then I'll walk you through um, um, how to identify the foreground of an image. Once you have the foreground identified um, and identify objects, you'll be um, splitting them into clusters. Once you have clusters, then there are the cellular subcompartments to be identified. And once you have those, you can start extracting measurements. And then I'll cover a little bit of st statistical analysis beyond that. So first, um, the image as quantitative data. So I'm assuming that if you're here listening to this presentation, you don't necessarily need to be told, but um, images contain a, um, a very rich uh, wealth of information. Um, we're at the point now where we can um, collect um, amazing fluorescent images from um, single cells, such as that shown on the left, all the way up to even whole organisms, such as um, the C. elegans worm shown on, on the right. So as far as taking these images and then extracting all the information that we possibly can out of them, uh, we can subdivide that into a series of steps. The first is um, acquiring the image, of course, so that um, necessitates that you have your hardware set up um, accordingly. Then there's a, some degree of pre-processing that's usually done to the images in order to set yourself up for success. Um, once you have that, then you can get into detecting the individual objects within the image um, through segmentation. And this also includes, um, say, um, uh, 3D assays and time-lapse uh, imaging and tracking as well. Um, making measurements and extracting features once you have that done. And then object classification, interpretation, and any recognition is kind of the end game of this uh, of a high content screening campaign. And then the results as as um, as a final as a final feature. So for image analysis, um, there's a whole host of various software solutions you can of course use, and I've divided them up into two basic categories. They're not ne necessarily mutually exclusive, but I find it helpful to think of them in these uh, in these terms. Uh, the first is uh, application modules. So these are good for someone who's new to high content screening or just kind of needs something more off the shelf that just works. Um, these are usually put together by um, um, microscope vendors. They come packaged with the microscope itself and they usually feature become a very good user interface. They're usually quite quick. Um, they also come with kind of a, a suite of validated and standard assays. 
And the approaches that these um, standardized solutions usually have are, is, is somewhat canned. Um, you don't necessarily need to be an expert or know even know that much about an image analysis to make this work. You can essentially just um, take it a la carte, plug it in, and go. Um, however, these sort of uh, solutions, while they're very simple, may um, not be quite adequate for more complex um, high content um, uh, image analysis solutions, which is where the second category comes in, um, which what I've called here as a development environment. Uh, these are good for creating new assays um, with a, and they usually entail a more flexible approach. You have a more customizable assay design instead of something that's off the shelf. Um, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes um, various modules or sub, um, uh, subsets of, of workflows can be combined into one overarching workflow um, the downside, if you want to call it that, is that there is a higher cost of entry. Um, you do usually need, need to understand some degree of image analysis um, in order to make this work, um, say a programming language or some basic scripting or something of that nature. Um, and of course, many solutions kind of um, can do both of these or kind of span the range between these two extremes. So here I have some um, examples of software solutions, and I emphasize that this is not comprehensive. So on the commercial side, you have um, Acapella by Perkin Elmer, Definions, um, Molecular Devices, GE. It's basically all the big names in the microscopy, um, in the microscopy uh, domain usually have some amount of software that can, um, that can be used for this purpose. Um, aside from those, you also have MATLAB, Photoshop, um, and other packages, which can also be used for very basic, uh, for basic image analysis. Um, on the other side, there's open source software, which is put out by the imaging uh, public community. Um, ImageJ and Fiji are, are well-known solutions. Cell Profiler is another one. Uh, there's BioImage, IC, Bob3D. Um, essentially, the sky's the limit. Usually, a Google search will give you any, any one of these. So this is just kind of a broad overview, and again, not comprehensive, but you have a wealth of solutions um, that are at your disposal, just a matter of picking the right one for your particular application. So assuming that you've picked a um, software that is um, to your liking, then you can get into actually um, identifying or working with an image itself. So the first part is identifying the image foreground. So here, I'll just call this call it some object identification. And you, it's, this is known by anyone of a number of names, but a name that's a term that's very often used in this domain is called segmentation. And all segmentation is, is just simply taking an image and cutting it up or partitioning it into regions of interest. And I divide this procedure into um, a couple of basic parts. And the first part is distinguishing the foreground from the background by thresholding. Now here we define the foreground as the pixels or the individual units of an image um, that are of interest. So the foreground are the pixels that you care about, and you're trying to distinguish those from the background, which are the pixels that you don't care about. And since we're dealing with fluorescent images, um, usually the foreground are the pixels that are much brighter than the background. And so you want to pick a threshold which divides up the foreground from the background by virtue of some fluorescent intensity. Now, in order to set yourself up, in order to detect the foreground well, um, sometimes, not all the time, but usually um, there's some amount of illumination correction that might need to be done. Um, just by virtue of the fact that you're using um, a microscope, um, the optics themselves will introduce non-uniformities into your image, regardless of what the optical, of whatever the biological sample may actually be. So, for example, in this image, this is a set of um, tiles of a specimen that are um, tiled together, and hopefully you can see that going from left to right, the left side of each tile is slightly brighter than the right side. And so if you're looking to um, try to identify the um, biological sample in the middle, and you're trying to do this by thresholding to get your um, your foreground pixels. Um, if you sit, uh, were to pick one particular value of the threshold, it might be biased towards the brighter pixels on one side versus the um, darker pixels on the other side. So by correcting for the illumination, you can even out this gradient of illumination in such that a single um, threshold might actually work. So one simple example of illumination correction is shown here, where we have a single well from a multi-well plate with some C. elegans worms in that well. 
And you can see very clearly here that the center of the well is much brighter than the corners. Um, one way to do lumination correction is, is uh, essentially flat fielding. You approximate the background, which in this case is being done by averaging many images from many wells together to estimate what that background fluorescence is. And then you can either um, subtract off or divide by this approximation of the background to get your final image. And you can clearly see that the background is now very um, uh, homogeneous. And now you have a much better chance of picking out these worms uh, from, from this well. Um, one way this can also be done is um, through a technique called uh, top hat filtering or rolling ball filtering, where essentially as seen in this image, again, you have a gradient of intensity from left to right on the um, left-hand side of, of the image. And then what you're essentially doing is taking um, this, essentially this um, a ball and rolling under the profile, which you see at the, bot at the bottom left, to approximate, again, approximate the background, and then subtract that off in order to yield a uniform background for which you could identify the features, in this case, these dark spots, much more, um, much more accurately um, on the right-hand on the right -hand image than the one on the left. Okay, so that's as a pre-processing step. So assuming that you've managed to um, sufficiently um, correct the background of your images, now you're ready to actually do the thresholding. And so, again, the, th um, the idea of thresholding is shown in a very simple schematic here. Um, let's say what you're seeing here is a, um, a histogram of pixel intensities. The pixel intensities are shown on the x-axis. Darkest pixels are on the left. Brighter pixels are on the right. And the number of pixels um, at each intensity is shown um, by the height of the histogram. And so the foreground is that small peak that's over on the right. And you want to distinguish this peak from the um, background pixels that are over on the left. So the question here is, what is the best um, threshold value or single value that would divide the distribution on the left, um, the pixels you don't care about, from the distribution on the right, the pixels that you do care about? So there are any one of a number of places where you could place a threshold, for example. So if you placed it here towards uh, the left, you can see here from this image, from this little tile, um, we're showing a fluorescent nuclei on a dark background. And the green line shows or encloses all the pixels that are above that chosen threshold. And you can see here that, yes, this green outline does um, surround or enclose the nuclei, but it gets a little bit more than you bargained for. Some of the background, the dark background, is also captured by this uh, choice of threshold. So in this case, the threshold is captured a little too much. Let's say we put the threshold more to the right, closer towards uh, um, the brighter pixels. So here, again, the green line shows what's been in, what's um, enclosed by this choice of threshold. And you can see that, um, yes, we've in, captured only the pixels that are within the nucleus, but only the brightest pixels. Um, the, um, you can see some of the um, uh, nuclear pixels peeking out outside of this, green, uh, of this green outline. So in this case, the uh, choice of threshold is a little too stringent. So we're capturing too much. So it's a kind of a classic Goldilocks problem in which the um, optimal um, choice of threshold, of course, is somewhere in the middle where you're getting just much, um, not too much, not too little, but you're capturing something just right. You're just getting just the pixels that belong to the nucleus and nothing else. So this is kind of a trivial example where the histogram very clearly um, shows you what the right answer would be. But in reality, um, things are often much more complicated than this. Um, but there are cases in which, a, um, you know, due to the biology or due to the assay, um, finding a single value that divides foreground from background may actually um, not be doable. So in those cases, um, one technique that's becoming more and more popular are um, um, pixel-based classification in which there are you know, certain software packages in which you feed in the images, you then annotate by hand um, to create a training set or a training set of pixels to say that these pixels on the image belong to the foreground, these other pixels in the image belong to the um, background, and maybe other pixels belong to some other class entirely. And then you're basically letting um, a machine learning algorithm on the back end figure out 
what are the distinction characteristics of the foreground versus background versus whatever class, and then the computer comes up with the final with the final answer. So this can also be very powerful and is becoming more and more. Uh, you'll see techniques like this more in more and more use uh, nowadays. Okay, so through whatever method, whether it's by thresholding or by machine learning, assuming that you've now identified the foreground, now you can start identifying um, individual objects within this foreground region. So um, thresholding is fine and good, of course. And if your uh, um, objects within the image are very well isolated, then you're basically done. Each foreground region constitutes an individual object, or and by object, I mean a, a collection of touching pixels that constitute a single biological entity. Um, of course, in many cases, like say nuclei, you have um, nuclei that are touching, for example. So here we have two objects that are touching each other, and so you would have one foreground object, but multiple in, um, uh, multiple objects within this one foreground region. So the next thing that you need to do is identify the individual objects that are contained within this foreground blob. So again, there are different ways to do this. Um, one example that you'll see is something called watershed segmentation, in which you can uh, consider the image as a uh, surface with basins. Um, here, you're essentially looking at it as if it were a um, um, a set of trenches in which you are um, putting a pipe underneath and then pumping up water to fill the basins from underneath. The areas or the um, regions where one basin begins to overflow into its neighbor, when that happens, that constitutes an, an edge between basins. And so watershedding um, is a very common, common technique. You may or may not see it referred to by this name, um, but I just wanted to familiarize you with this particular term. Other ways to um, separate touching objects, so this intensity-based method, um, or watershedding as I described, um, it often works best if the objects in question are brighter at the center and dimmer at the edges. So for example, for nuclei, for example, that often fits the bill in which, because the, uh, um, say, DAPI or hosting nuclei usually are pretty bright towards the center, and so you can rely on a um, dim edge between touching nuclei in order to identify um, regions or the um, lines that separate one nucleus from another. Another technique is a shape-based technique, which works uh, can work pretty well for touching identifying touching objects, especially um, if the um, intensity is rather is more homogeneous. Um, in, in other words, if all the um, intensity is so bright that you can't necessarily distinguish one object um, from its uh, from its neighbor. In this case, you're leveraging the fact that for some objects, nuclei being a good example, where um, the areas where the uh, nuclei are touching um, usually have some sort of indentation or, or a convexity, or I should say concavity um, between them. And then you can use those indentations as a key that the, um, uh, there, are two touching, there are two objects that are touching at that spot. Okay, so assuming that you've um, segmented or declumped um, these clusters, and to identify the individual objects within your foreground regions, now you can start identifying the cellular compartments themselves. So the first thing, um, or the first subcompartment that is very commonly identified is the um, is nuclei. Um, nuclei stains are very easy; they're very cheap, um, and quite simple to do. So I usually recommend that um, you try to identify the nuclei first. And if you don't have a nuclei stain, I highly recommend that you actually go get one um, because they will um, set you up well for identifying other um, objects within, within your image as well. So identifying nuclei is easy. Identify, identifying cells, though, that can be a different matter. Um, regardless of the cell stain that you use, just the fact that the cell stains are usually more heterogeneous by virtue of the cells themselves being heterogeneous, um, the contrast soften just a little bit lower, and especially in confluent monolayers, you may have um, uh, cells that are very readily touching each other, and it becomes even unclear, even by eye, um, in this image I'm showing you here, as to where one cell ends and where the other begins. So 
the techniques that the techniques that I just mentioned in terms of thresholding can be very straightforward for nuclei, not so much for for cells, as you can see by the segmentation results on the lower right, where the outlines of this of these uh, segmented objects don't really follow the outlines of the cells. So another way to tackle this is something that um, can be called um, secondary object identification. And again, if you're using um, um, say vendor software, this may come under a completely different name, but the principle is, is the same. Um, this, the workflow basically is to identify the nuclei first in a leveraging the fact that they're high contrast, they're readily identifiable. And then using a um, cell stain, you would use their nuclear objects that you just identified and grow outward from those objects using the uh, cell stain as a guide in order to tell it where the growth to start and then the growing outward pixel by pixel continues until you hit um, a neighboring growing area. So that is a way to identify cells without having to um, necessarily threshold um, in the regular way. Now for some assays, um, you don't even need to necessarily identify the cell body itself. So for example, for a translocation assay, you just need to know, is my protein or marker of interest in a nucleus in a, or in the cytoplasm? You don't even necessarily need to ex exactly define the borders of the cytoplasm in order to make that determination. So in that, um, in that case, you may not even necessarily need a cell stain you could just simply take the nucleus and grow it outward by some number of pixels to essentially approximate the cytoplasm and then go from there. Um, so that allows you to um, you know, go down, not have to use even a cell stain reagent and get the same basic result just by having a nuclear stain. So you can use this technique to create a cell body by proxy and, and that can be convenient. Okay, so once you've identified um, subcompartments, like say the nucleus and then the cell body, you can also go further and start identifying other subcompartments within the cell as well. Um, again, with the proper fluorescent labels, you can identify just about anything you want. So here, um, this is using a, I believe, a, um, a um, histone stain in order to identify um, DNA damage within the nuclei. And using all the same techniques that I've just described, um, you can start identifying these individual foci within nuclei. So you still have your pre-processing step in which um, you can see the foci in the upper left image, but with this high nuclear background, you may have a hard time identifying the individual foci. So you can use some um, in background subtraction techniques to remove the background fluorescence within a nucleus to get you something that looks more like what's on the, um, the uh, upper right panel. Once you have this pre-processed image, you can then do thresholding to identify the individual foci. And then the one extra step that might that can be needed is to say, you know, there's still the issue of which foci belongs to which nucleus, if you want to do a, say, per nucleus foci count. Um, and again, whatever software you're using um, should have some way to assign um, relationships between one set of objects versus another. And so the final step is saying, this foci within this region belongs to, say, this enclosing, enclosing object. So coming back to our outline, um, now assuming that you've, you've done your foreground identification, you've done your thresholding, you've done your um, object identification um, of whatever kind of objects, um, uh, nucleus, cell, foci, uh, whatever else is within a cell um, that's of interest, now you can start going into actually um, making measurements. So the next several slides are actually gonna go into different types of measurements that you can take and really the sky's the limit here. Uh, the most common type of measurement, um, I would say by far is just simply counts of various types. So you have um, such measurements here as the number of cells in an image or well, the number of organelles in a image or well, or the number of organelles per cell. Um, and just the simple um, number of objects or number of cells per image or well is often a useful readout for QC purposes. You can check for, um, say, um, toxicity effects, for example. Uh, measuring object morphology is another very common uh, type of measurement. And morphology, this is a word that can be used in many ways by different people, but essentially the definition is to 
reduce some aspect of the object shape to a single value. And so when someone comes to me and says, I want to measure the, sh um, the shape of my cells, um, usually the next question I have is like, well, what kind of shape measurement are you looking at? Here I just have a few types of features that can be measured. So uh, the area, the perimeter of an object, those are kind of fairly straightforward, um, you know, just simple geometry. Um, eccentricity is a measure of object, um, how oblong or how oval-like an object is. Um, major minor axis length is another um, uh, set of measurements that kind of measure that same sort of thing. Uh, form factor can be a measure of compactness. Then there is, and then you're going kind of down the line into some of the more arcane features, like say Zernike features that um, measure essentially how pointy an object is. And this is just a, a subset. There are many more um, types of object shape measurements that can that can be done. Um, one thing that is um, um, of note here is that if you have the option of, if you're interested in measuring shape and you have the option of excluding objects that touch the uh, border of the image, you should probably do so because um, taking shape shape measurements of say half an object doesn't necessarily make sense. So if you exclude anything that touches the border, you should do it. Um, next, measuring the object intensity is another very common uh, type of readout that is obtained and that's just simply um, measuring, uh, making a measurement that's proportional to the amount of fluorescent label that's at a given pixel location. And just like with morphology, um, if you were to say, you know, I want to measure the intensity, there are a lot of different types of intensity that can be measured. So some examples are the integrated or total intensity. So the amount of the total amount of um, fluorescence within a given object across all the pixels, um, which is assumed to be proportional to the um, amount of, of um, your protein or, or um, what have you that's being labeled. Uh, the mean, median, standard deviation of these intensities, those themselves can be um, readouts, um, upper, lower intensity quartiles. Um, you can also kind of combine these together. So correlations between channels, can you, between multiple fluorescent channels, you can see how the intensities vary with each other. Say in one channel, does the fluorescence go up with a treatment? Um, versus another channel where it goes down, or do they both go up together or go down together? Um, that's what correlation is begins to, begins to get at. Or even co-localization, do you see um, multiple fluorescent markers in the same spatial location or not? Um, and as you can imagine, since we're dealing with intensity, everything I've said um, before about the pre-processing in order to el do illumination correction applies. So you do want to make sure that um, you illumination correct beforehand before you start making these sort of intensity-based measurements. Uh, for texture, texture is a little bit harder to get a handle on, um, but in short, it's a uh, measure of whether the staining, fluorescent staining pattern is either smooth or coarse at a particular scale. And one way I'd like to look at it is if I'm looking at, say, you know, the surface of a table, if I'm looking at it, uh, say, two feet away, it may look very smooth, but if I'm looking at it under an electron microscope, it looks like the surface of a moon, like lots of dips and hills and valleys and so on. So it's the same object, but depending on the closeness or the scale that you're looking at, the texture itself may be very, very different. I think these uh, the images on the, on the upper right, though these are of um, virus capsules, and you can see very distinct textures um, in each of these panels. So higher scales, you'll get larger patterns of texture. Smaller scales, it gets um, uh, finer patterns of, of texture. And depending on the biology, those can be uh, described interesting phenotypes. Now here we have measuring location. So typically, um, the location of a cell within an image is not terribly important, whether it's in the center or whether it's off to the edge. Uh, you don't necessarily care. Um, but in some cases, the location of an organelle within the cell can be important. And that's where um, the XY location, the proximity of a um, organelle with respect to the nucleus or respect to the uh, cell border, those sort of location measurements can be very important. And one, um, one example of, uh, of such a measure, of course, would be time-lapse imaging, usually, um, especially if the cells are moving. So if you're doing cell-to-cell -cell tracking, um, in those cases, you are very, very interested in exactly where the cell is moving to. And so the XY location within an image becomes very important. And speaking of time-lapse analysis, um, 
just this uh, quick uh, diversion uh, here. So you can imagine that this sort of analysis is very, very sensitive um, to all the constraints that I've mentioned already. Um, you really need to uh, nail down object identification in order for time-lapse uh, analysis to work. If you're going to be um, connecting across time uh, the location of an object from frame to frame to frame, if an object drops out of view um, for any one of a number of frames, that just makes your time-lapse um, analysis that much harder. And it's, it um, just goes, uh, stands to reason that um, garbage in, garbage out, GIGO applies here. So before you even get to the point of image analysis, you really want to make sure that um, um, your assay development and your acquisition, those other components of the, um, the um, high content screening toolkit are locked down before you even get to this point. So, but assuming you've done all that, um, then you definitely want to make sure that you take note of any missegmentations that may crop into your image by virtue of whatever analysis you're doing. And of course, there's a, um, there's a number of software tools, both um, commercial and open source, that can help you with these things. And here, uh, measuring clustering, so spatial relationships between objects, how closely packed um, a set of objects are, um, those can uh, also be helpful measurements as well. So the number of neighbors that an object has, the percentage of the perimeter that's touching an object, um, a neighboring object or the distance to the nearest neighbor, those can all be um, readouts that are helpful. And you're not just limited just to individual measurements, you can also combine them together. So in some cases, identifying a phenotype of interest, um, it may be straightforward if the phenotype is simple. One or two measurements that you can just sort of pick out by hand um, would be sufficient to pick out some phenotypes. But for other phenotypes, it's just a much um, harder ask. And so this is where machine learning can come in, where machine learning, machine learning techniques can take multiple uh, measurements and combine them together in order to define your phenotype of interest. And it can do this not even, not just with the um, sort of straightforward vanilla uh, measurements, but even some of the ones that are a bit more um, uh, harder to, to interpret, like say texture. Um, for a human being, can be hard to sort of make sense of what some of these measurements are, but in, with the machine learning approach, it'll, it'll, it can do the right thing in terms of identifying your phenotypes of interest. And so heading into the last part of, uh, this, um, of this presentation is this statistical analysis portion, assuming that you've made all the measurements that you need, you need by this point. So uh, quality control is, um, is one key idea. So of course, any sort of quality control should be done at the beginning of the workflow. Um, so a couple of um, uh, typical quality control measures that I, I tend to look for are um, focal issues and also um, saturation artifacts. So the focal issues, um, this is just simply, um, is your, your camera go out of focus during the course of the acquisition um, due to exposure? Um, that's something that can um, often be um, detected and or you know, remedied if found early enough. With saturation artifacts, um, I usually see this in the form of um, fluorescent of debris, um, lint or what have you that just made its way into the well and ends up as a big bright blob in the middle of, of your image that uh, in some cases ends up turning up as a false positive when you're looking at your hits. Um, if at all possible, you can use um, automated measures to define to find each of these, and usually it's best to um, you know spot check a number of these uh, manually just to make sure you don't miss anything, but also to make sure that your QC metrics are doing what you're ex what you're expecting. And also, there are machine learning approaches here. You know, not just for you know the sort of thing can be, can be used uh, not just for identifying phenotypes, but if you um, view a uh, aberration as a phenotype unto itself, machine learning can also be used for exactly this, in exactly the same ways as I've described already. So assuming you've QC'd the image, um, then you can start working or digging into your data. So what does the data look like? And so in this case, I'm going down to the single cell level in which um, here is shown a single cell and this um, small uh, thin line at the bottom is what I'm calling a cyto profile. It's a, essentially a feature vector for which each of the measurements that you've taken is, is, um, is part of this kind of long barcode or string of numbers. And that's just for one cell. Now imagine this for all the cells across a well, 
and for all the wells across your experiment and for all the features that you've measured. And you can easily capture now not just one or two, but tens or hundreds or perhaps even thousands of features. And so you can imagine that um, the body of data that you're working with is much, much, um, is can be quite, quite large. Um, gigabytes, perhaps terabytes of image. And this is just for a 2D image. You can imagine for a 3D image or 3D plus time lapse, where this sort of thing can um, where you can deal with a, a lot of um, a lot of data very quickly. So given that, um, one thing um, that's often done with data analysis, regardless of the amount of data that you're dealing with, is data normalization. And this is used to re remove any sort of systemic uh, errors from the data. So just by, again, by virtue of the biology, um, you'll have, you can run exactly the same screen in exactly the same conditions on one day versus another, say day to day or month to month. And you'll see um, differences that creep in um, through no one's, no fault, uh, fault of anyone's own. And data normalization pr um, provides a means to um, correct the data on the experiment to experiment level. Um, the idea is that similar measurements across different wells with the same treatment should be um, should correspond to each other. So this points to the importance of having uh, controls um, within your experiment. Again, this is going back to the um, essay development phase. Either positive controls, negative controls. If you have both, great. Um, common approaches to do data normalization is say percentage of control. So you're taking each measure and dividing by the mean of that same measurement from the control wells. Um, if you don't have controls, then you can do a percentage of the examples. So you can take a measurement and divide it by the mean of that measurement from all the samples. Usually that assumes that all the samples are, can be treated as basically similar to your neg negative controls. Um, it's not uncommon during um, screening campaigns that most of your library or um, um, treatments do nothing. So you can treat those as if they were negative controls. And then you can also do like z-scoring, robust z-scoring, where you're taking your data and transforming it such that the mean is set to zero and the variance is set to set to um, set to one, and that is another way to to normalize. <clears throat> and another way to do it is uh, is to um, use percentiles rather than say standard deviations. That's a little bit more um, robust to outliers. In terms to statistical analysis software, um, again. Just like everything else, there are multiple ways to handle this. Um, but spreadsheets are still kind of the bread and butter of um, this sort of field. Excel is still very popular in, in terms of just getting a first look at the data that comes off. The, um, the data that comes out is usually in some sort of table format. So spreadsheets are, um, are essentially ubiquitous, um, and everyone knows about them. Uh, the problem here is that um, for the types of, um, uh, for large screens, Excel is, is going to choke if it um, comes up with a, uh, if you handed a, a CSV that's more than a few um, uh, megabytes or, or gigabytes in size. Um, so again, coming back to the microscope vendors, sometimes, not in all cases, but many in many cases, they have some sort of bundled software that gives you some basic data analysis functionality um, and also some um, uh, that comes with the image analysis tools as, as well. So here, just again, an example of some statistical analysis software and the caveat that this is not comprehensive especially goes here because um, it's um, these sort of tools are not just for HCS but also for a much wider range of software as well. So you have a wide variety of but products, they're often bundled with the software. Um, and so um, as you um, look at scopes or other hardware, talk to the vendor about details on this. Um, open source tools include NIME, Crawler Analyst, Wicca, Bioconductor. And if you're more into um, doing um, uh, programming, then you can also work up scripts using MATLAB, R, and Python. So um, we're coming to the close, circling back to the fundamental steps that I described at the beginning. So starting with image acquisition, I took you through a little bit of what uh, pre-processing to clean up your images um, in preparation for object detection, segmentation. And then once you have identified 
the um, individual objects within the um, within the image. You start making measurements, extracting features, and once you have those features, there are different tools you can use to classify them, interpret them, and then start making measurements and get your final scientific results out of it. But at the end of the day, all of this is, is meaningless unless you as the biologist or scientist are bringing your knowledge about this particular um, application or screen uh, to the forefront here. Um, you will need to leverage the domain knowledge that you have in order to make the proper decisions at each point along this workflow. So as far as additional resources are concerned, um, there's a lot out there, but I just wanted to point you to just a couple in this area. Um, there is a kind of an oldie but goodie. This is from 2009, but it was put together by the Carpenter Lab, which gives you a nice intro um, to two-dimensional fluorescence um, uh, analysis of microscopy images from PLOS uh, Computational Biology. Uh, there's a, a review <clears throat> in Nature Ethics from um, 2012 that goes over some of the biological imaging uh, software tools. And there's also the assays guidance manual that was put together by the NIH, which covers not just image analysis, but also the um, image assay development phase as well. So again, the as part of the final summary, um, again, we have these three components and they all need to work together, be interlinked together, and be um, very thoughtfully um, considered all together. Um, but once you do, um, you'll be prepared to use image analysis to work on high quality data and get some good science out of it. So with that, that is the end of my talk and I'll be ready to take any questions. And thank you, Dr. Gray, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, we will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, looks like we have a few questions coming in already. Um, the first question is, Dr. Gray, how can you apply some of the correlations when measuring object intensities? Okay. Yep. Um, so I assume everyone can hear me. But um, yeah, as far as these correlations are concerned, so this is the sort of thing that usually whatever software you're using will have it as an, an added feature that can be um, measured at the same time because the correlations um, are derived from the intensities. So of course you need to measure the intensities first. And depending on the software you have, um, it may just have it, have it as an additional option to get the correlations out of, out of them. Um, depending on how savvy you are in, in terms of um, uh, sort of say programming or scripting or that sort of thing, if the software you have does not measure correlations, for example, um, you could say put it into say Fiji or ImageJ. Um, they have plugins that allow for um, measuring these sort of features or, or other features as well. So it's sort of a feature, um, image feature derived from a image feature. So there may be a little bit more work that's involved if it's not already there as part of the package, but um, yeah, it's certainly measurable with a little bit, bit of extra work. Thank you so much, great. Okay, and the next question we have is, as more people in AI and ML work on these issues, where do you see the interpretations of the biology becoming relevant? And who then will be interpreting, interpreting the data sets joint or hand off to AIML? No, okay, so that is huge. Um, so AI, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, so AI like artificial intelligence, ML, machine learning, so those two things usually go together. Um, but either way, whatever you call it, AI, ML is essentially letting the computer make certain decisions on, um, on uh, sort of what the data essentially means. So for example, you know, you have a program or um, you feed in a whole bunch of image features or quantitative data, it goes through this you know, sort of black box, that's the machine learning program. And out on the other side comes a decision, like for example, um, is this cell of phenotype A or phenotype B? Um, that would be like a classification problem. Or it could be a situation where you have um, you know, um, data going in, um, based on 
controls, like say positive controls, negative controls, and then you have more a um, regression problem where you feed in new data that it has not seen before, the ML problem has not seen it, and then it makes a decision like, is it um, close to A or um, A or B or something in between? Um, so it's not so much assigning a, um, a value to the input, it's more making a, a, um, an assessment as to um, a predict, uh, essentially a prediction of what this of um, what the input actually is. Either way, um, the issue of interpretation is a big deal because, like I said, it's it's a bit of a black box at times. Um, even for the people who make these sort of programs, um, a a long-standing issue in the so-called deep learning field. It's that's a term you may have heard of before. It's gotten a lot of play and um, from various companies like Google, Facebook, all those sort of things. Um, you have um, these algorithms and machines that are making these sort of decisions on biology, and you don't necessarily know, or the, the biologist doesn't necessarily have a window into how the computer made that decision. Um, so the question comes up, how do you know it's right? Um, you can say manually check the answers for say a few um, screening treatments or a few perturbations for a screen, but if you're dealing with like hundreds and thousands or millions of, of perturbations, how do you know um, whether the answer is correct or whether it even makes you know re any real sense? And so um, you cannot cut the person completely out of the picture. So at some point, the biologist is still, it's still the, the onus of responsibility is still in the biologist to confirm that what the um, ML you know, box is, is coming up with actually holds water. Um, is it completely one or the other? Do you fully trust the machine or do you, does it have to be totally the biologist? It's definitely gonna be a joint, sort of a joint thing. The two should be working together in some way. And uh, there is a lot of ongoing research as to open up the box in other words, to make the what the um, ML program's doing a little bit more transparent, so it's not so much of a black box, but um, getting it so the biologists can understand what it's doing. And also, um, as time goes on, these sort of algorithms will become more um, familiar. And so the biologists may um, be more familiar with how these sort of algorithms work and develop more confidence in what is coming out of um, out of these algorithms. So I can I see like these two pieces kind of converging and moving towards each other as as uh, as time goes on. So that I think that's that's basically my answer. Thank you so much. And um, those are all great questions. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, uh, the next one is: Do you think that Auto ML will take into account all? Uh, all these steps and that these types of processes will be completed automatically or will or will it always be necessary an expert to make the decisions make decision yeah oh. so it's that's a kind of peering to the crystal ball sort of uh, sort of question um so this very much kind of goes back to the garbage in, garbage out principle, and you've seen this not just in high content screening space but in other in other spaces where um, how well the ML works depends on the input that it's trained on in order to give your to give the answer. Um, the more information it has, the better it will usually it usually tends to do. So for certain assays or certain conditions or um, circumstances, there may come a point where um, you can sort of hand it off because there's enough history, there's enough track of a track record um, to build with um, between the um, what's being delivered by the box and what um, um, uh, the biologist who is interacting with it to say, okay, I can, for this assay, I can pretty much assume that it's gonna give me the, the right answer. And so there is that handoff going on. Um, but for certain other cases, um, the, the biologist definitely needs to be in there, definitely needs to uh, be involved. And this is especially true as the stakes get higher. Um, I'm not talking in this context, we're talking about probably early assay development, but you can imagine for say clinical trials, you know, uh, cases where patient outcomes are at stake. Um, you wouldn't necessarily, the, the, um, 
uh, AI ML approach will definitely be helpful, but you would not necessarily want to trust the entirety of patient outcomes to, um, to just a machine. You want uh, pathologists, clinicians, and so on still in the picture. So I kind of, I think that's an analogy that I find helpful, um, that um, the, the machines can certainly be human, um, human informed and will be built up that way, but a human is still part of the picture. Great, thank you so much. And then we have, um, you have as such database as, as um, concerns. So what kind of cells yeah. is the question? Yeah. Okay, so that is totally going to depend on the assay, um, the assay at stake. So for my purposes, so for the work that I tend to do, um, this is all using microscopy, of, of course. So the cells should be amenable to imaging, hopefully. Um, they should be adherent, so they actually stick onto the surface. Um, in my particular case for this um, essay called Cell Painting, which is becoming more and more popular, um, the cells um, should not only be adherent, but they hopefully should also be flat. They kind of look kind of like a fried egg if you look at them from the side. That means when you take a microscope and look at um, image planes through the cell, you have a very um, small focal depth and you should be able to get most of a cell with a single focal plane um, and get much of the resolution that you that you need so cells that kind of fit that bill um, are are useful for that specific context um, but even aside from imaging concerns what it's going to be what's going to drive it is physiologic relevance what are the cells that are the most relevant for what you're studying um, in my case u2s cells are good because they they're very image ready in in that sense um but you know they are a um you know a bone cell line which you know may not be relevant for say a different type of cancer um so you will definitely want to use whatever cells are most relevant um and then but all the same um tools tips tricks you know those sort of things segmentation measurements and so on all still apply regardless of the of the the cell line um, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to what's most relevant for your biology. Um, you know, oh, another one is also like, you know, 2D or 3D. So um, organoids are becoming more and more of a, um, of a cell model that's being, that's being used. So you're going to need a whole set of different concerns when it comes to 3D imaging and 3D analysis. You know, are your cells amenable to that? Does that capture more of the physiologic relevance? Well, that means you're going to have a whole new set of challenges that, that come along with it. Um, and then cell lines versus primary cells, kind of those sort of issues. Again, you know, primary cells are kind of closest to human, closest to patient, but they're notoriously can be difficult to work with as compared to cell lines. So it's going to come down to usually those sort of issues and this trade-off between, you know, how close is the cell cells to the biology that you want to study versus how easy are they to work with and, and you know, um, how imageable are they, how well can you get measurements and so on. And so there's not a one size fits all answer, but hopefully you can find a compromise that um, gets you where you want to be. These are all great questions. Thank you so much for everyone being so engaging. Um, we have one. We have time for one final question. Uh, going back, um, what are best practices as to designing an experiment to analyze this way? Numbers of plates, numbers of replicates, uh, mm -hmm. objective. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of goes into the initial assay development, which I'd mentioned is kind of the the stuff you want to sort of nail down before you even get to the analysis um, side of things. There's nothing worse than having a whole set of uh, images show up on your desk, and then you realize, oh, the experiment just wasn't quite designed the right way, and then you have to go back to the back to the drawing board. Um, so again, this is going to be driven by um, the biology that you're you're trying to study. So. Uh, I'll take them kind of in reverse order. So objective, the microscope objective itself, um, do you want 10x, 20x, 60x? Um, you essentially want the objective that is going to capture um, you know, the detail that you want to see that describes the phenotype that you're interested in. Um, so of course you could dial it all the way up and go to like 60 or 100x to get like you know really high res images, but you're going to suffer from, you know, if um, you're going to need to take more snapshots, more fields of view, 
um, per well to capture everything that you that you need. So that's going to increase your acquisition time. Um, is that a trade off you're willing to make? Um, you know, more resolution for more imaging time. Um, you might be able willing to do that, or it just may not be doable if you're doing a screen of you know a 50k compound screen. Um, and the same thing goes for the other um, uh, categories or considerations as well. So number of replicates, ideally, more replicates, the better. Um, the more you know, technical or biological replicates you have, the better your, st your st statistical power will be so that you can trust the data that's coming out. But then you have to be willing to accept the increased um, acquisition time, um, culturing time, and so on to make those make those replicates um in in the cases i've looked at you know typically like three you know um um the replicates would be would be desirable per per treatment um but there have been cases where we've gone up to like you know five or six but three seems to be pretty um pretty common but again it's going to depend on what you're looking at and number of plates usually will reflect the number the number of replicates and the number of treatments that you're you're dealing with um, and again, that's that's a logistical concern. You'll be, um, are you doing a you know a screening of a hundred treatments or hundred compounds, or is they you know uh, fifty thousand uh, compound screen? That's going to control the number of plates and the number of replicates that you can you can um, you can deal with. So all of these things kind of work work together, um, but it's going to be driven by a combination of logistics and the biology that you're trying to capture. And again, finding a happy medium that kind of gets you, tries to get you the, the best of all worlds. Thank you again, Dr. Bray. And thank you to the audience for these amazing questions. Um, it was a very informative presentation. Uh, it looks like we are running out of time for today, but as a final reminder, Questions that were not were submitted and not answered today by our speaker will be addressed via email. And this presentation will be available for an on-demand viewing in the SB12 virtual conference for 12 months. Please remember to share it with colleagues who might be interested in today's topic. And don't forget to miss out on the other presentations on our agenda. Thank you again for your participation. And until next time, have a great day. Thank you.